Hello everyone, welcome back to my lectures on environmental ethics, where we look at some different philosophical perspectives about what ethical commitments we have to the environment. In other words, what is it about the environment that matters, or at least should matter to us. In our first video we looked at anthropocentrism, according to which we should value the environment because of how it affects humans. In our second video we talked about zoocentrism or zoocentrism in an ethical perspective according to which we should care about the environment both because of its effects on humans and other species of animals as well. The thought more or less went that there seems to be no real grounds on which to argue that morality should be limited to only humans. If humans matter, there's no reason why other animals, that is, non-human animals, should not. In today's video, which is the last one in this series, we will look at biocentrism, the ethical perspective according to which we have to value all life, whether or not it is conscious. What matters to this perspective morally is simply that a thing lives. Much like in the previous two videos, the defender of this view can argue that we not only should care about our life, but that we already do. Consider the following thought experiment. Let's imagine an apocalyptic scenario, a rather bleak one, where everyone has died. That is, all the humans and animals inhabiting the world, except for one final human who is faced with the last tree on earth. The question is, is it in some sense wrong if the final human would cut down the tree for no real reason? The intuitive answer seems to be yes, something does seem wrong about cutting down the final tree even though that act won't have any consequences for anyone since everyone in the thought experiment is a dead. One explanation why we'd feel that way could be that biocentrism, the valuing of all life, is a perspective that people to some degree already accept. In other words, it seems that the action is wrong exactly because we value the tree as a thing that is alive. We could restate the thought experiment as the final human approaching the pyramids of Giza and blowing them up, since according to the thought experiment there won't be anyone to ever see the pyramids in any case, it does seem that what happens to the pyramids simply doesn't matter. On the other hand, simply because there won't be anyone to ever appreciate the final tree, in our first thought experiment, it still feels wrong to cut it down. That is, because the pyramids have instrumental value, that is value for someone else, us, humans. While the tree seems to have inherent value, that is value that is there for itself, whether or not there is anyone to appreciate it. It is important to note this difference, since biocentrism could be easily misunderstood to mean we should value all life and nature because nature plays an important part in a human psyche and health, for example. That, however, would attribute instrumental value to nature, a value for us, humans, value that only exists because we are here to make use of it. Biocentrism, in contrast, maintains that nature has value on itself and for itself. To further illustrate this point, let us return to the discussion between anthropocentrism and zoocentrism on the moral status of animals. A human-centered ethic would attribute inherent value to humans and instrumental value to animals. That is, animals are useful as a food resource, working force, etc. Hence, if someone comes up to my car and slaughters it without my consent, the action is wrong since they took a thing from me that is valuable to me. Animal-centered ethics, however, would maintain that animals have inherent value, that is independently of whether there's humans to make use of them in any way, and cruelly slaughtering a car is wrong in any case, whether or not their owner agrees to it. What matters is that the car would not agree to it if she had the cognitive abilities to understand the concept of being slaughtered. Furthermore, a zoocentric perspective would maintain that nature has instrumental value because it provides food, resources and shelter to humans and other animals, hence it is important to protect the equilibrium that keeps our natural environment functioning. In contrast, biocentrism maintains that either or both individual plants and the ecosystem as a whole have inherent value, that is, value that is not dependent of conscious beings making use of nature. The question we have to ask ourselves, of course, is why biocentrists maintain that this is the case, or rather should be the case. There's a wide array of answers. One is that just like humans and animals, 
life forms such as plants have an interest of their own to reach their biological potential, that is, to survive and prosper. Now, we might ask how a thing that has no consciousness can have an interest, saying that almost seems like a contradiction in terms. So we need to understand that what the defenders of this view truly mean is that unlike that matter, all life is oriented towards some goal of their own and it sacrifices a lot of energy and resources to get there. To biocentrists, it doesn't matter that life forms such as plants have no consciousness and therefore don't care about achieving that goal at all. To biocentrists, some things are good independently of whether beings are aware of it. Hence, we can give vitamins to our cat and can genuinely say that vitamins are good for the cat, even though the cat is not aware of that goodness. In the same way, we can say that things are genuinely good or bad for life forms such as plants, even though they have no awareness of such facts. The good is biological, independent of conscious experience, and our moral considerations should acknowledge that good. What's interesting here is the practical question of what that entails for how we should treat life forms such as individual plants. Some thinkers, such as the well-respected Albert Schweitzer and the more contemporary Paul Taylor, maintain that we can use animals and plants for our own needs only when absolutely necessary for survival. Hence, we can kill an animal if otherwise we would starve to death or if it threatens us, but not for trivial needs such as preferring the taste of meat over vegetables. Likewise, we can pluck plants for food and fell trees to build shelter, but we shouldn't destroy nature for trivial needs that are not necessary for survival. This, as you can observe, is an extremely demanding ethic. It would seem, for example, that I cannot pluck a weed from my garden because my interest to have a pretty garden is not necessary. In other words, it is trivial. It would also seem that when I go on a walk, I have to make sure that I don't step on any plant that I might destroy. So to ease this demand, some thinkers proposed a hierarchical frame that lets us value humans and animals more than plants, but still give plants inherent value, although less. It is not entirely clear, however, how this in practice differs from zoocentrism and anthropocentrism. So while anthropocentrism stems mainly from practice and zoocentrism remains entirely practical in its calls for vegetarianism and veganism, the question of how to practically apply biocentrism to our common practices remains difficult, open and, if you'll have it, quite interesting. But to continue our exploration, so far we only talked about ethical perspectives that focus on individual entities, be it humans, animals or individual plants. However, some thinkers observe that if interests aren't tied to conscious experience and there are goods that are independent from it, we can formulate goals that pertain to the interests of wholes, such as ecosystem and a species as a whole. Hence, if I slaughter the last remaining group of some subspecies of wolves, let's say, I not only went against the interests of the wolves to continue their lives, but also the interest of the species as a whole to spread its genome. If I destroy a forest, I not only go against the interests of all the animals that lose their home or their lives, and the interests of all the plants that won't reach their biological potential, but also the interest of the ecosystem itself that strives to remain in an equilibrium. It is not entirely clear how the interests of such holistic entities should be weighted against the interests of individuals, however. In principle, it seems that when the two are in conflict, a holistic ethic could take it to be permissible to harm individuals for the good of wholes, which made thinkers such as Tom Regan, who we mentioned in the previous video, quite skeptical of this view, calling it ecofascism. He's very skeptical of the idea that we'd give holistic entities moral standing, since that could easily crush the rights of individual beings. Which is a point worth noting, I think, namely that some theories are more prone to dangerous conclusions, which calls for some additional epistemic humbleness, which means that we should strive to be as self-critical as possible once we start moving in such directions. In this video, we asked ourselves, why should we value all life forms? 
One answer has been that just like humans, all life forms have some kind of interest and giving no moral significance to interests of other beings is unethical. However, another answer to this question is that the question itself comes from a philosophically problematic point of view. Consider the following. So far in these lectures, our argumentation has progressed from the seemingly certain fact that humans have value to considerations of whether non-human things do. The position commonly starts with the observation that I, the individual, obviously have value and then we expand our circle of moral consideration to our family members, usually to the members of our social circles, to people of our nationality and finally, if we accept enlightened humanism, to all members of our species. Many philosophers go further and expand the moral circle to conscious beings that are not members of our own species and then some go even further and expand it to individual plants and even the ecosystem itself. Some biocentrists, such as the so-called radical ecologists, maintain that this approach is entirely mistaken and in principle more ideological than truly philosophical in nature. After all, the slow moral expansion is what led to the misuse of our environment and animals in the first place. And even if it does get expanded so that it attributes inherent value to the environment, our moral relationship to nature still seems to remain hierarchical, so that humans kill animals if necessary and destroy whole ecosystems if truly needed. This, in some important sense, still remains to be deeply anthropocentric. To truly break free of our long tradition of anthropocentrism, a perspective that is deeply rooted in Western culture and got especially reaffirmed after the Industrial Revolution, a radical break is needed. One that is not solely based in arguments, but rather needs an expression through art and culture, which are the most effective means that truly let us transcend an ideology. Until this is achieved, the radical ecologists maintain we will never be truly able to break free and understand the true value of nature. So, to summarize, in this video I have presented some arguments for biocentrism and some different biocentristic theories, since it's really a diverse assembly of views, all with different reasons why it is exactly that not only conscious beings matter, but all life does. We have pointed out the difference between inherent and instrumental value and outlined some different biocentristic stances towards life, one valuing individual life forms such as plants, one valuing holistic entities such as the ecosystem, and one refusing to merely expand moral standing from the starting point of humans having value, but rather calling for a radical break with tradition in order to achieve a truly new philosophical perspective on nature. Hello, thank you for sticking by, I uh, really appreciate all the comments I'm getting with these videos and I'm looking forward to some more discussions because as you see I'm not really sure about biocentrism, so let's talk about it in the comments and at this point I would also like to ask you to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy this content and would like more like it because obviously this helps with the YouTube algorithm and shows my video to more people which makes my work more valuable, I, I, I suppose. <laughs>